Two weeks in a row, the Seahawks have some controversy, actually, George. There's been some uh, referee retalk in both games, but also the Seahawks not playing up to standard, of course. And uh, still in first place in the NFC West. So despite another loss, there's still a lot of positive on the season, if you ask me. Yeah, there's a lot of positive, but I mean, our offensive line is so bad. Geno Smith sacked seven times and... In general, yes, I see the optimism. Our offense looks good. We have some great players. Um, the offense still moves the ball, even despite the seven sacks. But it just feels really bad to, and hard to stay optimistic after losing to the New York Giants in the fashion that we did. And yes, like you said, controversy on the blocked field goal. Um, the more I read about it, the more it seems like there's a glitch in the rule that allowed them to do that you're listening to the sports on tap seattle podcast i'm sammy and with me as always is my older brother george your favorite place to be a fan of seattle sports now let's get this party started well yeah, that the might glitch be something of like it's not holding if you push him in down on the back and it's like not the guy who jumped so he didn't touch the long snapper it's something that's probably going to be worked on in the rule book uh, after, i was gonna say yeah, I was going to say the NFL competition committee will be meeting about that one at some point because, like, yeah, they found a glitch in the system. Then, well, be, until they change it, I will not be surprised if we see a couple more blocks, field goals at this at some point this season if other teams can do that. You know, I think the problem now is there's probably a discussion with refs. And, like, if you see that, call it holding, even though it's not in our rule book. Like, they can also do some stuff, I feel like, midseason that's kind of like, eh, like, don't be as uh, exact on the rule book when we see this one, because there are stuff like that in the NFL. Let's like be realistic here. There is a lot of misconstrued uh, late hits, misconstrued. Uh, what's it called? Like roughing the passers. Like it just depends on who the quarterback is sometimes, or depends on the ref that day. How like kind of like baseball with balls and strikes. Sometimes it like varies. And I think this is going to be one rule that gets a little bit more like, okay, you know what? If we see a guy just like holding down a long snapper to jump over the other guy, like maybe it's something we'll start working on right away. So I think it's going to get worked on. But at the end of the day, it was legal technically the way they did it. And it's just, a, uh, you know, I think to put it all in perspective for the whole game, and I think Mike McDonald also said this himself, is they just outcoached us, out-executed us in every facet of the game. Yeah, they really did. And I mean, I, this is not a, a podcast about the New York Giants, but if you're a New York Giants fan after that game, you have to be looking at your coaching staff and Brian Dable and be like, you know, in two out of his three seasons, he's turned, I mean, there's no Malik neighbors there and, he, and Daniel Jones has looked competent so far this season. So um, I, I would say like after we, it's not exactly like the Lions game where it's like, oh, you know, a lot of people were like, I took a lot more out of a uh, Seahawks and the Lions, but I do take, I don't think the Giants are as bad of a football team as they were made out to be. No. So it kind of helps. It doesn't help like, you know, process this and make it feel better. But I, I do want to pump the brakes. The Giants aren't God awful. Yeah, they're not a bad football team. And I, I think one thing that gets misconstrued about them is one, Do Brian Dable's a good coach. I mean, like he did lead them to the playoffs with Daniel Jones before. Um, or was it nine wins? I don't know if it was, I think it was the playoffs or it, or it was like a nine win season. Um, yeah. Brian Dable is a good coach. I, I actually, I think I saw this on Colin Coward show today that, you know, like the bills would probably be willing to trade Brian Dable back for like McDermott right now. If they keep losing games, like Dable is a guy that'd be a hot candidate for a really good job. Yeah. Um, even though he already has a job and Daniel Jones is not that bad. And I know he gets hated on a lot, but there's a lot worse quarterback play in the NFL than Daniel Jones play. But still, like you said, it's one of those games where I think on Monday night football, the week before you said, okay, Seahawks were missing seven out of 11 defenders. And we were in that game and maybe a call or two in that game that were actually called wrong or missed. Right. This one felt wrong, but it wasn't wrong. The, that game, it's like, oh, there was some calls that might have, you know, went our way or DK's fumble, which he keeps doing, that might have gone on our way and the game's different. This game felt more like, yikes, that's not good to lose. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, definitely not, not. It's definitely not good to lose to the Giants. But then you look at, but take a look at the rest of the NFC, right? And I kind of like went through like a little exercise here before the pod and I was like, okay. Who are like who is a dominant team in the NFC? Is it the 49ers? No, not with all their injuries. Is it the Detroit Lions? Possibly. 
Is it the Minnesota Vikings? I guess, but do you really trust Sam Darnold like long term right now? We've never seen him do it before. Is it the Commanders in the NFC East? They have a rookie quarterback. It's it's not like this loss puts us in a place where it's like, oh yeah, the NFC, uh, like every we're not that good. Like we're still in that upper echelon of teams in the NFC. But I think that's because there isn't really like a wow team in the NFC. Quickly for our sponsors, we have some betting companies that we want to shout out. First and foremost, for the Washington people, there is an app called Rebet. It is legal in Washington State and 46 other states or 47, something like that. You can bet player props, spreads, all that good stuff using promo code on tap. And George will tell you what they give you. Yeah, they give you up to a hundred dollar US bonus on your deposit. So if you put in fifty dollars, they'll give you fifty. The minimum deposit is ten dollars. So if you put in ten dollars, you get a ten dollar free bet and you'll get rebet cash. And if you bet rebet cash and win, you can convert it to real cash and deposit it into your account. It's a great way for states like Washington, Texas, California to actually bet on real sports lines. Spreads, player props, all of it, parlays. You can kind of do anything. It's been pretty cool to see. Um, and people are loving it. And if you're in another state or you're looking for a sports book or player prop apps like Underdog or sports book like Caesars, I'll have a link below the Rebet app uh, that links you to all our sports books that are part of our sponsors. And you can click your state and it'll tell you which are legal. And you'll see our offers there, our promo codes, our links. So wherever you are, if you're looking to put some money on games or you're looking to make player prop things, we have Underdog, Caesars, uh, Rebet app, and a few others, uh, Sleeper app. So click your state on that link. The one I'm going to have the rebet one straight up. And then there's going to be one right below it in the description that shows all the sports books. You can click filter it through which state it's legal and sign up for our code. You'll get more content from us and uh, it'll be supporting us. On yeah. Show. And if you do want to play in one of the sports books like Caesars, I do have to mention you must be 21 and over to participate and call 1-800-GAMBLER if you have a gambling problem. The legal stuff. Always necessary. <laughs> I love you guys. We appreciate you guys. And let's get back to the episode. I agree, but I also... I'm just looking at it. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you have to remember the NFC West right now is the worst division record in the NFC, like as a combined record. And if we were sitting in the NFC North, we'd be tied for third and fourth place with Chicago and Green Bay. If we're sitting in the NFC South, we'd be tied with two other teams. From the NFC East, we'd be in second place. So it it's more positive being in the NFC West this year while everyone else is also struggling. I don't know if I'd feel as positive if we're sitting... I, I know I'd still say there's no other dominant teams. I agree with that. But like if we were sitting in third place at three and two um, and the Niners started off the year good like the Vikings did, I would start saying, shoot, we're already two games back mm -hmm. and we have so many injuries and the 49ers are just as good as we thought they were. So I, I agree, but at the same time, there are some teams right now that are playing better than the Seahawks in the NFC. And I think we might luck out by having a division that's just beat up this year where we get the benefit of the doubt and still can win the division. So like I, I'm 50, 50 with you on that. I think as of two weeks ago or last week, I was less, uh, I guess less high on the NFC, but now I don't know. Like I, I'm still scared of Atlanta now. Now you see Kirk Cousins starting to get hot. Minnesota, Detroit, Green Bay are all good. Washington looks good. I, I don't know if we're. I feel like we're still tier two now instead of tier one, and that's where I've I've come down a little bit on the Seahawks the last two weeks. But to your point, we're not looking at a division that has the Chiefs or, or a conference of the Chiefs and the Ravens, and you're like, yeah, the Texans, yeah. Like I, I would almost like, yikes, say that we have no chance. <laughs> I would definitely, I would probably say the top three teams in the NFL right now are all in the AFC. Yeah. And that's I mean, what I mean. Where there's no except dominant. for maybe the Vikings. Yeah. I put, but do you trust the Vikings more than the chiefs Ravens and Texans? Mm. Uh, quarterback situation. No, but as a whole team, I mean, at the end of the oh, day, yeah, their team is stacked. <laughs> the defense is great. Sam Darnold looks great. I mean, Bill Belichick pretty much said it. And, you know, the, the way that he would, that like everyone likes Sam Donald except for the Jets. And you could also say the Panthers, but those are two teams that you don't want to be in there in a sentence with, right? 
That's correct. He goes That's to San Francisco. San Francisco wanted to keep him, but they didn't. They couldn't pay him ten million dollars as a backup. And right now, he's outplaying Brock Purdy. There's a reason San Francisco wanted to to pay him and keep him, not to start over Brock Purdy. But they're saying like, damn, this guy's maybe a starter in this league. Like he's actually he's freaking younger than Joe Burrow. Like let's just let's remember that. Like he's younger than Joe Burrow. Not an awful injury history, and was the type of prospect Joe Burrow was coming out of college pretty much like, Oh, this guy could be a QB one for many years. And when you look at the NFL, sometimes I, I've talked about this a few times on, I think on this podcast and like on some other videos on, on like my platform, you look around the league, George, you have the, you know, I mean, you even, there's a lot of guys I can mention outside of who I'm going to mention, but you look at a lot of these like second chance guys like Baker Mayfield, Geno Smith, Sam Darnold, um, I don't know. There's probably a couple other ones I'm not even realizing right now. There's a lot of guys that you know teams gave up on, and then they became really, really, really good quarterbacks. Right? So maybe it, Sam Darnold used to in not that. see that in the NFL much. Um, I think now maybe because people give up on quarterbacks so early, and they also start them so young. You draft a guy in the first round. It used to be like he's for sure sitting a year behind his. Um, the the veteran or the press the guy before him but now these guys start right away like literally right away they go in and start and then they give up on him on a snap of a finger so maybe that's part of the reason i mean i know geno smith wasn't necessarily that but i'm just talking in general a lot of teams give up on quarterbacks quick and they also throw them right into the fire quick i mean geno did get thrown right into the fire had a bad year and a half with the jets and then like the nfl was like okay you're not a quarterback anymore like you're a backup yeah and eventually the seahawks got to see him for a hurt russell wilson and seahawks were like no, he's actually a pretty good quarterback yeah. right now. He might be better than Russell Wilson, and he's younger. Um, and it turned out to be right. I mean, if you look at it, too, there's a lot of these quarterbacks that, you know, like uh, let's look at a guy like Michael Penix Jr., who's 24 coming into the league. He's considered an old quarterback coming into the league now. Yeah. When Sam Darnold got drafted, he was one of those guys that started in college at 18 and didn't redshirt and was drafted at 20, 21 years old. So by the time he had his three or four opportunities and got benched, he was the same age as Michael Penix getting drafted. Right. So right. like he, people do give up too young. And I think that's why now when we look at it, like th there's, there's some truth to believing in them. And that's where the NFC might be. Th there's so, okay. I think to your point, there's a lot of questions in the NFC, right? Because like you have teams like the Vikings and like the Buccaneers and, and even a team with a rookie quarterback and the commanders and you say, how long can this last? But then you also have teams that are playing bad, like the 49ers, but you know, they're good. And then the Seahawks had two bad losses, but they have a veteran quarterback and you know, they're pretty good. So I feel like there's definitely to confirm your point, there's definitely a like 10 times more question marks in the NFC than there are in the AFC. Right. I could I, I couldn't sit here right now and tell you who's going to make the like I mean obviously I couldn't tell you in the AFC either. It's hard to actually predict. But it's hard to say like oh yeah, I mean in the AFC you're like yeah, the the Chiefs, Ravens, Texans should make the Super well, Bowl. It's hard. I'll, I'll give you the top 4 division leaders is the Buffalo Bills, the Baltimore Ravens, the Houston Texans and the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah, you you those four teams, you would not be surprised if you they made the Super Bowl. If you told yeah. me right now, even though the Vikings have Sam Darnold and they're playing good, it's a surprise, right, that they'd be a Super Bowl team. Like well, maybe not today, but before the season. You tell me the Commanders before the season a Super Bowl team, pretty much a surprise. The Seahawks leading the division, a Super Bowl team before the season, that'd be a surprise. The Falcons, they're the only Tampa. ones, but that's or Tampa, like very, very mm -hmm. weird NFC. But I, it'll, the thing is, we got to take advantage of this opportunity now with the 49ers having the injuries that they have and try to get a cushion. And I mean, we'll we'll preview that game at a different time. But it's a huge game because we either are not first in a division or we have a nice cushion against the 49ers. It swings the whole entire, you know, first, this is game six, game six, six games of a season and how you feel going through six games. Yeah, I mean, you'll get to the point where you're at two games up on the 49ers, three games with, up with, on the Rams. With the tiebreaker. And, and a game and a half up on Arizona versus being tied for first place at three and three. And the Cardinals have the tiebreaker over the 49ers also. And the 49ers would have the tiebreaker over the Seahawks. Seahawks so like, yeah. If the Cardinals win on Sunday, we're technically third place. You, if we lose. Exactly. So, so this game yeah. will change everything you feel about the season. Yeah. And we'll preview that tomorrow on this channel and uh, on this podcast. But Things, things this week can be a very big, um, like what if scenario, like how can it, 
lead for the rest of the season, like a two game cushion or in third place. If the Cardinals win, that's a really huge gap, right? Like two game lead versus third place without tiebreakers. That's a humongous gap. And that's why though, George, when we go back to this giants game, that's why you don't you can't lose these games to teams like the Giants when no, you should this be wasn't the Colt McCoy Giants. This is the Daniel Jones Giants. Yeah. You don't you don't lose to the Daniel Jones Giants at home. And you know, the thing about the Seahawks team, and maybe many people would love to go back to the, the type of Pete Carroll led teams. It might be the personnel on these teams too, that we have a lot of inconsistency. I mean, the last couple of years of Pete Carroll's teams had some of these same guys on defense and offense. I know there's a lot of changes here and there, but there's still some key, same key pieces. The entire offense outside of a couple offensive line pieces are the same pieces. Exactly. And the defense, the corners are the same piece. One of the safeties, a couple of the defensive linemen. So there is some inconsistency with these players. And we didn't make, I would say a huge splash this off season. I mean, I do think, you know, we did well bringing in Terrell Dotson and Jerome Baker and the safeties have been playing all right. And we made some moves on the D line, but bringing in Byron Murphy, he's been hurt. Achena Nawasu played 20 snaps and he's on the IR again. Boy, Mafe has been in and out hurt. We have a lot of the similar pieces we had of these Pete Carroll led teams and we dealt with injuries and we dealt with inconsistency and we're kind of seeing the same thing again. Exactly. And maybe it's not a Pete Carroll thing, right? Maybe it's an actual, the players are a little inconsistent. Um, the offensive line's inconsistent. The defense is a little inconsistent. And there's a lot to be worked out on, but this is why you can't lose to the Giants. I mean, it, we'd be in such a different position. Well, we were just talking about, imagine we were four and one right now and you beat the Niners. You're a three game lead in the division, tiebreakers. Um, so it's a tough, tough loss to comprehend. And obviously, what's funny about football, or they call it a game of inches, is you know, the guy doesn't jump over the long snapper and you make that field goal, you go to overtime, you might win that game. And we're sitting here having a completely different conversation. Exactly. We we might be talking about the inconsistency still like, yeah, the team, they, they beat the Broncos by, you know, three and they beat the Patriots by three or whatever, six. Like we'd still say, yeah, there's a lot like to fix, but we would be saying that they also always find a way to pull it out, which is a nice touch. But instead we're talking about a loss because of a, a, a nice little, what was it? A loophole in the rules. <laughs> Some loopholes, yeah. And DK Metcalf fumbling again. Yeah, he has to fix that problem. He has the most fumble since he's entered the NFL out of any wide receiver. So, but he, he has so much good that he brings to the table that you take the bad, but try to fix that. Yeah. I mean, one hard thing with DK Metcalf fumbles a lot of the times, like uh, a lot of the. A lot of the like, wow, he can get a lot of yards after catch. He can truck stick a guy. He can throw a guy off him and go get more yards. But sometimes, like the Tyler Lockett mef- method of I caught it and I fell. And I got the first down. We didn't lose the ball. I didn't I didn't uh, make a mistake. Sometimes that's also a really good touch to have. It's just caught it, slid, never get hurt, never fumble, never lose the I mean, ball. Tyler Lockett drop takes it. it a little too far, but that's okay. Yeah, but then again, there's a reason he's still good, still consistent, never hurt, never fumbles, never makes a mistake is because any small, he's not DK Metcalf size. He can't truck stick. People. Yeah, yeah. So, but then at the end of the day, DK needs to fix that. I think the big message, George, from these last two games, let's just talk about Detroit and New York. There's a lot of things that need to be fixed up. Like, I yes. mean, every NFL team can say that, but I think the Seahawks have some glaring issues like protection, um, holding on to the football, maybe some discipline slash consistency. I don't, I'm not Mike McDonald. I'm not Pete Carroll. I'm not a head coach. I don't know how to fix all those things, obviously, but I think it's fair to say there's got to be a better way to get these players to be a little more consistent. I don't know what it is. And maybe it's coaching. It's the players themselves. I don't know, but the inconsistency is a, it's concern. It's a big concern. Yeah. It's alarming. It's a little bit alarming, but I think we'll fix it. We have the right coaching staff. So, yeah, and I think the last key piece is, and Ryan Grubb talked about it today. He said, that's on me. Kenneth Walker should not get five carries. No, never. I know he had a good dig uh, through the air. I think he had 57 receiving yards, but 
that's not where he's the most consistent in the game. And, and I think that a lot of that, that has to do with offensive line, not being able to block anyone, maybe some schemes they saw, but it doesn't matter. Like you got to give them at least 10 carries from the backfield, even if they're not working, even if they're inconsistent, you got to keep the play action alive and keep the defense honest and get them the ball as much as freaking possible. Yeah. I mean, he's a top five to 10 back in the NFL. You got to get him more than five carries. I mean, at the end 100%. of the day, I think a big part, we talked about this on the last episode, is balance, right? In an offense. Even if the offensive line's not playing well, what helps an offensive line is when the defense does not know what's happening every play. When you have yeah. 40 dropbacks and only five uh, running plays, the defense knows what's coming. And that's going to put more stress on the offensive line to pass block, and it's going to be harder because the defense is just predicting everything that's happening. At the end of the day, sometimes, even if you know a player's not having the best game, I think it was against the Dolphins or maybe the week before that, the Patriots where Zach Charbonnet didn't have the best day, but they gave him the ball. They kept the defense on their toes. And then Geno Smith threw for 350 yards. I think it's just helpful getting a couple more carries, even though sometimes, you know, it feels like in an NFL game, you see a guy like, all right, we keep giving the ball. It's like one carry for two yards, one carry for two yards, but at least the defense is on his toes. Exactly. Yeah. I would love to see that, but I think, I think we know it. I think they know the issues and, and I really have confidence in this coaching staff to fix this going into next, this next, not even next week, two day, two Dude. nights from now, Thursday night. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, it's going to be another weird week. I think, I mean, the 49ers have like 22 different injuries. The Seahawks have a good seven or eight injuries. Both teams are definitely not at full health, considering the fact that they got three days in between games. Also, I mean, it would be four days. I guess the fourth day is the day of the game. So three only off days. Mm -hmm. um, that's not going to help the injuries or help fix, clean up everything. But this is another type of game, George, where you just got to find a way to win it. It changes a lot of the course of your standing in the seasons. And we got to kind of let the injuries from both sides, from 49ers fans, from Seahawks fans, the injury's got to be like an excuse that's not made and just go win the football game. Completely agree there. Please win, though. Like, actually. hopefully, yes. Yeah. Especially against the 49ers and the throwback uniforms. You don't want to lose. So let's go win. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Um, tough loss against the Giants, but at the end of the day, it's NFL football. So you're going to lose some games you're not supposed to lose sometimes and win some you're not supposed to win. So we're underdogs tomorrow. Um, or Thursday, underdogs Thursday, but I, I do think there's a good chance we pull it out. So I, I think we, I, I think we can pull it out as well. Yeah. Well, make sure you guys turn on the bell, subscribe, hit the notification button, or if you're on Bing. the podcast platforms, uh, just press follow, I guess, or like you can also turn on notifications on some of them uh, to get when we post an episode. But we'll be back tomorrow talking about the 49ers Seahawks game on Thursday, and you'll probably see us Thursday night or Friday morning after that game as well. So make sure you. Uh, Turn on your notifications. Get used to these spaces, guys. Yeah, for real, though, because uh, there's a lot this week. It's a lot in a short amount of days, but we'll be here. We'll be rocking, and uh, we appreciate you guys today, and uh, we'll be back tomorrow for the preview episode. And, George, you know what we like to say? Hey, thanks for stopping by. <laughs>